All right, so let's start our talk about the immune system. Um, the first thing to know about the immune system is that it's divided into different sections. And uh, the two main divisions of the immune system are what are called the uh, innate response and the adaptive response. Um, the adaptive is also sometimes called uh, the acquired immune response uh, because it is the part that learns. Uh, both of these systems like work together to be your immune system, but uh, they didn't necessarily evolve at the same time. Um, so like older creatures, like say, you know, insects and stuff like that, uh, have elements of the innate response, but don't necessarily have the adapted response, which we think is newer. So um, the innate response has to do with, like, when you suffer a security breach, when you become infected by something or something is trying to infect you, uh, this is what always happens. Your automatic response, no matter what the intruder is, is like a security system for your house. Like anytime somebody tries to break in, um, it's going to do like the same thing. So it's going to blare a siren. It's going to lock the doors. It's going to call the police, right? No matter what it is, even if it's like, you know, you trying to get in because you forgot your keys or whatever, um, it's always going to respond the same way. Whereas the adaptive response uh, is going to be highly tuned, specific, very powerful, and target like a specific microbe. Uh, the, the innate response and the adaptive response are also divided. Uh, the division is clearer with the adaptive response where there's definitely two parts to it. There's what's called the humoral response, uh, the cell-mediated response, with the humoral response being the part that deals with uh, um, antibodies and things like that. Uh, and it's going to protect you from any pathogens that are found in your body fluids. Uh, humoral and humors is an old Greek term uh, that means uh, body fluids, like your, your body fluids or your humors, like blood, pus, you know, uh, bile, things like that. The cell-mediated response is going to be directed against any pathogens that can actually invade and occupy your cells, or which are your cells. And so this is primarily going to be against viruses and uh, cancers. Now, the innate response is... Uh, it breaks down into a whole lot more pieces. Um, but there's two kind of broad categories, which I'm going to call barriers and inflammation. All right. Now, this looks pretty neat. You got two categories, and then each of them splits into two categories on their own. Well, this is what it really kind of looks like, because each of these things has a whole bunch of different parts to it. And all of these parts, they all communicate with each other. So, like, you have phagocytes that are part of the inflammatory response. And the phagocytes are actually going to communicate with the lymphocytes. And the lymphocytes are going to make antibodies, and the antibodies are also going to communicate with the phagocytes. Um, you have some things that kind of like span exactly where things are, right? So um, you have natural killer cells, which are related to lymphocytes. They're a type of lymphocyte, but they operate as part of the inflammatory response, or at least as a part of the uh, innate immune system. If the complement system here, uh, which is a part of the innate immune system, but can be activated by antibodies from the adaptive response. 
and uh, don't memorize this, right? You don't need to memorize all of these things. This is just to show you that what we're talking about is a very interconnected system um, where everything is talking to and affects everything else. So I think the, 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 the easiest one of these to understand and the one that I'm gonna focus on right now is the barriers. Uh, barriers are your body's way of not getting sick in the first place. And you've got two general types of barriers, skin and mucous membranes. You guys have a, probably a pretty good notion of what your skin is, right? Your skin is the, uh, the barrier that faces the outside world outside your body. That, I know that sounds weird, but like your skin faces the outside world and specifically the part of the outside world that's outside of your body. You also have mucous membranes. Mucous membranes are the barrier that faces the outside world that's inside your body. How do you have an outside world that's inside your body? Well, you and me and all animals more complex than a jellyfish are basically tubes. You're a tube, I'm a tube, you know, um, insects are tubes, worms are tubes, worms are very clearly tubes. Um, but basically what you are is you have a, you're a tube, you've got a mouth on one end, an anus on the other end, and maybe you have a couple of pouches, All right? And stuff can go through this tube, you know, something could go in your mouth, all the way squirm around and out your butt, and it would never have to actually get inside your body. All of that stuff is technically outside of your body, believe it or not. Um, you know, nothing has to ever pierce one of your barriers to get in that way. But the barriers that face this inside world are mucous membranes, not skin, because they have a different function. I kind of like to think of barriers uh, as you got two basic types of barriers, walls and doors. All right. Walls are very good barriers. They keep stuff out, they keep stuff in, and they don't make any choices. They just do it. All right. If you want to get through a wall, I mean, you've got a few options, but basically you've just got one option. You can try to break down the wall. That's kind of your only option there. Um, then you have doors, right? Or any portal. Uh, and doors function as a barrier, but they don't just keep things out and keep things in. They also let things through. And so um, your skin is like a wall. Nothing is supposed to get through your skin. Your skin never intentionally lets something through. It doesn't open up and let stuff in. Um, it is just like it, a wall. It keeps stuff out. Whatever side of the barrier you're on, that's the side you stay on. Your mucous membranes are more like doors. They are inherently leaky because they are things that stuff is made to be able to pass. You know, in your lungs, you have to have oxygen getting into your body and carbon dioxide getting out. In your digestive system, you have to allow uh, nutrients to get in. Um, in your uh, urinary system, you have to allow urine to get out. So uh, anywhere you have these mucous membranes, what you need to have is a barrier that lets some things through but doesn't let other things through. Now, if you were trying to break into someone's house, what's going to be easier? Going in through the wall or going in through the door? 
Well, usually it's going in through the door. The door is inherently a weaker structure, right? You could just like kick your way down through the door, but you could also try to sneak in. Maybe the door is open. Right? Maybe you could knock on the door and pretend to be a delivery person to run through when they open the door. Uh, maybe you know you could get an invitation in, uh, pretend to be a friend from out of town or something like that. There are lots of ways to get in through a door. There's really only one way to get in through a wall, and that's not the wall down. So skin is an exceptionally good barrier. Uh, but mucous membranes are not so great a barrier because they have this inherent function of letting things in. Most things that infect people get in through the mucous membranes. Uh, some things get in through like a breach in the skin, like a wound. You go find somebody whose wall's already been knocked down because a car plowed into it or something and then you can get in that way. Uh, but, um, but things that actually get in through the skin are pretty rare. Uh, most things that invade you get in through the mucous membranes. So those are your physical barriers. And uh, there are things that make them good barriers. For the skin, some things that make it a good barrier. Um, are it is waterproof all life is water-based the vast majority of microbes basically live in water and the only way they can get around is by swimming or floating through the water so if something is waterproof then there's just no path for the microbe to get in easily so that right there is uh is something that helps your skin be a good barrier what is it that makes your skin waterproof? Well, um, there's a few things. So let's go here. Uh, so your epidermis is made of uh, cells called uh, keratinocytes that have tight junctions between them. Tight junctions uh, tend to be waterproof. Uh, and also, you have oil glands, what are called sebaceous glands, that secrete an oily substance called sebum. As you're probably aware, oil doesn't mix with water. So that's going to also help to make your skin waterproof. Uh, the, so another thing, um, is you have antimicrobial substances, right? Um, one is sebum, which is an acidic oil. Most microbes don't like to live in acid. So the sebum itself discourages microbes from spending time on your skin by being acidic. Your sweat glands are salty. And as you are probably aware, uh, most microbes do not like to live in salty environments. Your skin is also constantly dying, right? If you think about it, it, anytime you look at someone, pretty much everything you see when you look at someone, it's all dead, right? Hair, dead cells. Nails, dead cells. Your skin, the part of you that somebody can see, the upper levels of your epidermis, those are all dead dead. The highest levels of your epidermis are dead cells. Uh, so at, when you look at somebody, you are literally looking at their corpse, um, at their dead bits, because that's most of what you can see for someone. Only the eyes are alive. 
uh, most of what you see from somebody is, is like the dead bits that are sloughing off. And that's important. Your dead skin cells are constantly sloughing off. When they slough away, they carry any microbes that have landed on them, with them. So microbes can't stay on your skin for very long because your skin dies and it falls away and it carries any transient microbes with it. Dead cells are dry. This helps to contribute to their waterproofing effect. And dead cells are, well, they're dead. And that means that uh, they can't really be infected. If you think of like a virus or some bacteria that like get inside cells and replicate there, well, let's say you're a virus, right? You get inside this dead cell. Well, that's not gonna help you, it's dead, right? You can get inside it all you want, but it's not gonna make more viruses because it's dead. So those are some of the things that help your skin to be a very good barrier. Now, as far as your mucous membranes go, um, these are not dead cells. Most of it is not inherently waterproof. So what is it that makes it a good barrier? And really, the key is in the name. Your primary defense on your mucous membranes is the mucus. Um, mucus is thick and sticky. Microbes will get like into it and they'll get stuck. Like they're in this like big pile of goo. And the uh, microbes will then like, it's gonna take them a while to get through it. And your mucus doesn't stay in one place. It's constantly recycled. So, Often, when a microbe gets stuck in mucus, before it can get through to your actual cells, the mucus is going to go out one end or the other, right? It's either going to get, you know, get coughed up and go out of your, your mouth or nose, or it's going to get drained down into your stomach where the stomach acid will destroy the microbes, or it's going to go out the other end and get flushed away. Um... So the, the constant recycling of this mucus carries away microbes that get stuck in it. Uh, in addition, the mucus itself is full of all sorts of antimicrobial substances. Um, primarily antibodies. You actually have a special type of antibody called IgA. We'll talk about it in a future section. Uh, but IgA is, an, is the most abundant antibody in your body, and it's only found in mucus. It isn't found in your blood or anywhere else. It's found in your mucus, and so your mucus is just loaded with these antibodies. Um, in addition, uh, your mucus, as well as some other things, has a number of other antimicrobial substances, right? So, like, salt is the obvious one. We talked about this. Um, but lysozyme, lysozyme is an enzyme that degrades peptidic glycan. Uh, it's primarily found in tears and lacrimal secretions, so the fluid that bathes your eyes, um, but that fluid actually gets into your mouth and then down your throat because your tears drain into your nose and then into your mouth. Uh, and so the lysozyme gets a lot of places. And if it degrades peptidoglycan, what do you think it does to bacteria? It destroys them. Um, it's particularly effective against gram positives, which are more cell wall based. Uh, you have lactoferrin. Sorry, lactoferrin. Lactoferrin binds iron. Um, microbes, most microbes, require iron to live. So by binding and sequestering iron, you steal it away from the bacteria, you prevent the bacteria from being able to use it to replicate, and you basically kind of like starve them. Uh, peroxidases break down peroxide uh, into free radicals, which are very dangerous to kind of like everything. 
And so a lot of cells use peroxidases uh, to defend themselves. And you also have peroxidases in uh, the mucus of your mucous membranes. They destroy anything that gets caught in the mucus. You have a lot of other what are called antimicrobial peptides as well. So for instance, uh, you have uh, defensins. These are found all throughout the body and um, they are uh, peptides made by you that assemble into little pores and poke holes in the membrane. And uh, membranes don't like having holes poked in them. Um, you know, if the cell gets holes poked in its membrane, it usually dies. Uh, dermicidin, which comes out uh, in your sweat, through your sweat glands, is an antibacterial and antifungal agent. It also disrupts membranes. Um, uh, histatins, which are found in your saliva, keep your oral cavity uh, clear of fungi. They disrupt uh, cellular functions in fungi. Um, you have uh, cathelicidin, which is another membrane disrupting uh, compound found on the skin. And last but certainly not least, you are not the only thing that lives on and in your body. You have a big set of resident microbes. There are already bacteria living on your skin that live, that have evolved to live in concert with you and that by and large are more helpful than they are harmful. You have a bunch of bacteria that live in your mouth and a whole slew of bacteria that live in your intestines. All of these things live on you. You are their home. They don't want you to die because then they're homeless. And they certainly don't want some newbie coming into the neighborhood and screwing things up. And so they help to protect you. Not because they're like great people or anything, but because you're like their house. So of course they're going to protect you. Um, one of the ways that they protect you is by secreting what are called bacteriosins, which are antimicrobial peptides. Um, they produce things that kill foreign bacteria because they don't want foreign bacteria coming in. Uh, so uh, the last part of your barriers isn't even technically a you. It is the microbes that live on you. They help you in a number of ways. They produce these bacteriosins, uh, defensive peptides. Uh, they also, um, they cover binding sites, right? There's only so many places where bacteria can land on your body. Kind of like there's only so many parking spaces in a parking lot. Well, if the parking lot's already full, you kind of can't park there. And so just by having all of the places where bacteria can bind on your body already bound to bacteria, then that's, you know, then the bacteria can't land. Uh, they also consume the available nutrients. There's only so much available bacteria food on your body. The bacteria there are pretty good at eating it. That means that new bacteria don't really want to show up. There's nothing for them to eat. Um, so they produce toxic compa compounds, um, and they also help to develop the immune system. Your immune system learns by training on the bacteria that are present. Many of the bacteria that live on you that are friendly bacteria have dangerous cousins. So like by your immune system training on staph uh, epidermidis, which lives on your skin normally and is usually very non-pathogenic, um, your immune system can learn to fight against the more pathogenic cousin, Staph aureus, right? Which, you know, also can live on your skin, but causes a lot of uh, pathogenic conditions. Um, this is important enough that if you disrupt the normal microbiota that live on somebody's body, 
uh, you can very easily make them immunocompromised or allow an infection to get in much easier. Um, these are what are called antibiotic-associated uh, uh, disorders, um, or at least some of them are, uh, because if you take an antibiotic that kills off all your venative bacteria, you then become vulnerable to infection because you've lost that part of your barrier. Or if you have something that, uh, something else that changes the environment of the bacteria that live on and in you, such as hormonal changes uh, that can infect or can affect the bacteria that live uh particularly in uh, the human vagina. Those are very um, susceptible to hormonal changes and that can result in a potential infection. All right, so those are the basic barriers of your immune system.